Welcome to After School with Mr. Van Huss, episode 15. Today I've got a great writer on the show by the name of Dan Jolly. Now I first noticed Dan's work through DC Comics because he was the co-creator of the second version of Firestorm. And he also wrote some amazing Elseworld stories that dealt with the Justice Society of America. It was JSA The Liberty File and JSA The Unholy Three. If you ever get a chance to check those out, they're wonderful. He has gone on to write some really amazing science fiction and fantasy novels, both for kids and adults. He has done work for video games. He's done other comic books. He's just an all-around amazing writer, and I'm so happy that he's here talking to me today. Here's Dan Jolly. Welcome to After School with Mr. Van Hus. Thank you so much for joining me, Dan. How are you doing today? I'm good. I'm good. I'm glad to be here. Oh, man, I'm so glad that you were able to uh, sit down with me. I've been a longtime fan of your work. I think I, uh, I first noticed you through DC Comics because I've always been a big comic book guy. And uh, you first caught my attention with Firestorm and uh, JSA, The Liberty File and The Unholy Three, which I thought those were uh, some of the best stories, especially for that whole time period right there. And um, have, have followed you a bit as you've gone through video games and novels and a little bit of everything. So for, uh, for those that may be watching, for my students who may not be familiar with your work, I'm going to let you introduce yourself and just tell us a little bit about you. Uh, my name is Dan Jolly. I grew up in uh, Northwest Georgia, and um, uh, after being gone for about 20 years, that's where I am again. Um, and uh, I started writing professionally when I was 19. I was still in college. Um, and by the time I was 25, I actually began getting stuff published that was good. Um and uh, yeah, I started out in comic books, got from there into uh, licensed property novels like TV tie-in novels, did a Star Trek book and an, a, a book to do with the TV series Angel, the Buffy the Vampire Slayer spinoff. I uh, went from there into video games. Um, the Probably the best known video game I did was uh, a thing called Dying Light, uh, which was a, a zombie versus parkour game. Mm -hmm. Um, and, um, I've been publishing, uh, original novels for a number of years now. I've written, um, uh, my, my 18th novel is about to come out in, uh, well, not about to come out, but it's going to come out in September of this year. Um, so yeah, I've just kind of, uh, as long as I'm writing, I'm happy, basically not real picky about the format or the media medium. Uh, I actually uh, kind of dipped my toes in the TV water a little bit. And I sold a pilot uh, to Nickelodeon a few years ago. It, uh, all, all the executives that were there at the time that were shepherding the project along got fired. Um, Viacom, the parent company, came in and, and did this totally clean house. Uh, it got rid of all the existing projects um, anyway. So, yeah, I'm just kind of been bouncing around writing various things for... Uh, decades now that's awesome so what influenced you to do that like what made you want to be a writer uh that's probably largely because i was like functionally an only child uh, i have two siblings a brother and sister but they're both a lot older than i am and uh so by the time i was in first grade my older brother was off and gone to college and then my sister was gone two years after that so um we didn't have much in the way of money, so we rarely went anywhere or did anything. <laughs> so, and and where we lived, I didn't have a lot of friends around me. Um, and uh, I, I know this will probably be shocking that a professional writer was kind of a weirdo and misfit in school. Um, yeah, I was uh, was pretty awkward. Uh, so it, basically what it turned into was me spending a lot of time alone. And uh, I just kind of started making up stories, you know, to, to, to entertain myself. Uh, that combined with my older brother, when he came back from college, had a habit of bringing back these big Xerox paper boxes filled with comic books. Um, he, he'd bring back this, and he was not a collector. He was strictly a reader. These things would be like just tossed in carelessly, wrinkled, folded in half, rolled up, you know, but... Uh, 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 he and dad both um, had a love of science fiction that they passed on to me. So I uh, was a kid with an overactive imagination, lots of time on my hands, 
and lots of uh, source material to to like guide me in the uh, the nerd direction. And uh, yeah, I just I just started making up stories and haven't ever really stopped. That's incredible. So some of your early work was what you did for DC Comics, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. Um, I was I was really fortunate. Um, I got into the the whole industry. I was writing short stories for mainly for like my own amusement. And um, when I was nineteen, um, and this is a long time ago because this this takes place at a video game arcade. These things used to exist, you know. I remember now, those. they were awesome. Yeah, yeah. I went to uh, I went to an arcade at the <laughs> at the Macon Georgia Mall. And um, the the girl, the arcade attendant there was really cute. And I asked her out on a date. And uh, on the first date, uh, I told her that I like to write short stories. And she said, well, have you ever considered writing comic books? And I had been reading comic books my whole life, but I never, never thought about writing them. And I told her that. And she said, well, I know a couple of comic book artists that I could introduce you to. And one of them was Tony Harris uh, that I went on to uh, work with for like 10 years. Um, and so that was that was kind of a lightning in the bottle uh, situation, you know, really unusual circumstance. But if you want to try to replicate that, going to conventions like sci-fi comic book conventions, there are artists there. Um, a lot of them are looking for a writer to collaborate with. You know, you can you can generate the same kinds of relationships that I did. That's great. I, I don't remember what the question was. Oh yeah, you answered it. That was perfect. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> um, before you got into your field of work, like who were your heroes in that field? Like who did you grow up reading that you liked a lot? Uh, so let's see. Um, oddly enough, Louis L'Amour, um, the Western, primarily known for writing Westerns. I think I've read every Western Louis L'Amour has ever read, uh, written. Um, and uh, Robert E. Howard, and then the classics, Robert E. Howard, uh, the creator of Conan the Barbarian, mm -hmm. H.P. Lovecraft, and uh, hugely influential on me as a kid, Larry Niven, the science fiction writer Larry Niven. Okay. Um, his his work, I think, was what uh, largely inspired the creation of Halo. Uh, he wrote a series called Ring World, which was about a, a, a people who have played Halo. They know about the ring that encircles the entire star. And uh, he he wrote a series about a different ring world uh slightly later got into high school and i started reading a lot of dean Koontz. um and i think he's probably the most influential just on my prose style uh and a little bit later than that the uh the comic book creator james obar the guy who created the crow um massively influential on me in, in some of the, the most formative times um and um and then probably the the one that had uh, the, the latest with the lasting effect was Quentin Tarantino. Um, seeing Pulp Fiction in, I think that was 1996, yeah. um, had a, an enormous influence on the way I approach dialogue. He was the first one that he, like watching Pulp Fiction, um, one of the big important lessons was when you've got characters who are doing a thing, and they know what they're doing and why they're doing it. They don't talk about it. There's no need you know, this uh, the, the internalizing the dialogue in Pulp Fiction was transformative. I would say for me, that's very very cool. So you mentioned in high school you were you know a little bit of an outcast, a little bit of a little bit of a nerd. Um, huge, what, huge <laughs> nerd. nerd. Yeah, I, I can relate. What uh, what further education did you have past past high school? Uh, I went to Dalton College for two years. That's a little community college just south of where I grew up, uh, and transferred from there to the University of Georgia. All right, and uh, got got an English degree from there. So yeah, to 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 crib from John Mulaney, uh, I, I paid money to get a degree in a language that I already spoke. <laughs> it's always helpful. Did you have a favorite teacher or a favorite mentor along the way who kind of helped you along or encouraged you to write or anything like that? 
Um, in high school, yeah, yeah, I had a few pretty good, pretty good teachers. I had one. Uh, her name, her her name was Joan Jones. Sounds like a and, character. <laughs> um, she, uh, my senior year in high school was the first year that AP courses were taught, were offered um, at uh, Ringgold. I grew up in a town called Ringgold. That's one word, two G's. And uh, Ringgold High School, uh, 1989, was, the, or I guess 88, was when it's my senior year started. Um, that was the first year AP courses were offered. And so I ended up taking AP English. Um, and uh, so, like, you take the big test at the end of the year. I don't know if it still works this way. At the time, you took a big test at the end of the year, and you get a score from one to five. Yeah. And uh, I, I was the only five. Uh, in in the first ever AP English class, and uh, she she was very very pleased with that, very happy. And I, I I don't know if that translated to like the school getting more funding or, or what, but she was she was over the moon about it. She was a great teacher, uh, encouraged me a lot. Um, yeah, I, I I owe her a good bit. Just just if nothing else from the encouragement mm -hmm. aspect of things. Well, I can tell you AP has not changed a bit because I still teach a <laughs> class called uh, uh, AP Human Geography, and it's still graded on that five scale. Um, we we don't really ever get anything extra from, you know, students doing well on that. But I'm always um, extremely happy when I have a student who gets a four or five because those those AP tests are killers. Like they they really get you prepared for, you know, further education. Yeah, yeah. Um, I. I don't think I had uh, an English or creative writing class anywhere in college that was harder than uh, than going into that AP <laughs> AP English test in senior year of high school. So if you got the ears of high school kids, you know, you've got students listening to you. What is one life lesson that you would pass on to them that you've learned along the way? Um, OK, so. I'm going to give a an example that is specific to writing, uh, but I think it can be translated into a general life lesson. Okay. I think we'll see. Okay. Um, so the most important piece of writing advice that I have ever gotten is, and I, and I tell people this all the time, if you're writing something, do not go back and reread what you've written until you're done with the entire thing. Uh, whether it's a uh, one-page piece or a short story or a poem or um, or a novel, I wrote my I wrote my first novel when I was sixteen. It was terrible. It was it was as as bad as you would expect it to be. Um, but uh, the the reason that I give this advice is that the creative part of your brain and the editing part of your brain are different, and. If you if you write like the first page of a story and then you go back and you think, oh, I can I can make that first paragraph better or I can make that first line better. Um, you, you, you change it. And then you think, oh, I can make it even better than that. And you change it and you, you wind up never getting past that first page. Um, that starts what I refer to as a, a feedback loop. And uh, I don't know how many writers and aspiring writers I've talked to over the years who don't ever finish a project because they think they, they, they can go back and, and fix what they're doing and they never get to the end. And what you have to do is give yourself permission to write a first draft that is awful. It's fine. First drafts are bad. First drafts are supposed to be bad. Um, the the first draft of any kind of writing project, I've heard this put a bunch of different ways, but I think my favorite is, I think Stephen King said this, you just, you're just shoveling sand into the sandbox. That's that's all you're doing. You just, you just get enough material in the sandbox. Second draft, that's when you can begin to go back and turn it into a castle. Um. You know, you're you're just you're just telling yourself the story. Uh, Neil Gaiman, creator of The Sandman and a bunch of other awesome stuff, American Gods, and co-creator of Good Omens, 
Um, he said that the second draft is when you begin to make it read like you knew what you were doing the whole time. Um, giving yourself permission to be bad at something the first time you do it. That's, I think that's what can translate into a general life lesson. Uh, and this is any, any kind of creative, anything, maybe any kind of anything, not even necessarily creative. Um, if you're going to, if, if you, if you're going to rebuild a small engine, the first time you do it, you're probably not going to get it right. Um, but it's fine. It's totally fine. Um, I don't know how many people that, that I've met uh, there are out there who feel like they have to be perfect the first time they do something. They, they, they feel like, oh, if I'm if I can't get this right the first time, then, it, then, that, then and that's not meant for me. And it's just not true. It's just it's profoundly not true. Um, you know, I've I've had a by. I guess by standard measure, a reasonably successful writing career. Um, and like I mentioned earlier, the, the first novel I wrote was God awful. And uh, in, in fact, I started getting published. Well, the, the first contract I got when I was 19, the company went out of business before they paid me, which is fun. Uh, yeah. But I started getting, getting paid and published when I was 21. Yeah. And um I don't, I don't think I wrote anything really worth reading until I was about 25. But as you, as you do stuff, as you, as you do more of it, um, you get better at it. Writing is like lifting weights. It, the more you do it, the better you get at it. The important thing is to know that when you start out, it's going to be probably kind of bad and that's fine. That's totally fine. Don't put pressure on yourself. If you want to, if you want to try something, if you want to start learning to play the guitar, if you want to start uh, a, a podcast, if you want to start a YouTube channel, the, the first time you do it, you don't have to look like some sort of polished seasoned professional. And especially when you're in high school, the, the stakes are so low. <laughs> that's that's one thing i've learned the older you get the higher the stakes are if you do make some sort of catastrophic error you know if you if you uh try to start a business when you're 45 um you know depending on how all in you go with it you might you might have things on the line like a house mm -hmm. or a marriage or you know whatever when you're in high school just go for it just go for it. What's the worst that could happen? You, so your podcast isn't very good. Who cares? The more you do it, the better you'll get at it. You know, if you're going to, if you're going to start something, especially something creative, start now. Don't be afraid to start now. And don't be afraid if it sucks to begin with. It's supposed to. First time you do anything. That is great advice. I tell my classes all the time. I tell my own kids. I tell my kids here at school. You don't have to be perfect. And that's that's probably one of the biggest things that I teach in my classroom is it's OK to fail at some things. It's OK to not be good at first. And, you know, the better work will come along if you just keep at it and keep practicing and just believe in what you're doing. You'll get there. Yeah. The the, the one important thing is just to, to do your best. Mm -hmm. Do your best at it. And, you know, you do you, you like if you were going to I don't know, if you're going to start doing wood carving. Do your best when you when you're carving your little you know, uh, bird head or whatever, <laughs> you know, uh, and do your best. And then if it's you know if it's bad, then when you come back, you'll be a little bit better at it. And you do your best at that one. And you know you do that for a little while, and you know the next thing you know, then you've got something in an art gallery or whatever. That is great advice. And Dan, I, I so appreciate you taking some time to sit down and talk to me, talk to my students and stuff today. I've been a, a longtime fan of a lot of the work you've done and this, uh, it really means a lot. So I greatly appreciate your time. And hey, my pleasure. This is fun. All right. And thank you very much for staying after school with Mr. Van Huss. <laughs>